So it's Friday, and that means it is our Ask a Life Coach episode. And today we are talking about one of the questions, if not the question, I get asked about the most. When people hear that in today's economy, our family of 10 spends under $700 on groceries every month, this is always something that people want to know more about. And so I've actually talked about this before on the podcast, and I talk about it on Instagram. I even have a 24-month-long money coaching program where talking about saving money on groceries takes up four to five lessons in four different modules. There is that much to talk about when it comes to saving money on groceries, which means there is a lot of different things that you can do. And so when I was asked about how to spend less on groceries, I thought, you know what, let's talk about it again in a little bit of a different way. So today on this episode of the podcast, you will be hearing some tips and strategies and really mindset focuses that will help you spend less on groceries. So let's jump in and listen. Well, hey there, I am Jennifer Roskamp, a certified life coach and homeschool mom of nine who is passionate about helping women just like you embrace the here and now while also being focused on creating the life you actually want. In reality, it's not about thinking life will get so much better or so much easier when you fill in the blank. Let's work on creating a life you love now. So let's dive in and get started on redefining Supermom to be someone who is present, intentional, and content rather than perfect in our homes, in our lives, and in our own skin. Let's get started. This is the Intentional Mom Podcast. So the price of groceries today is scary, isn't it? Like when you sit back and look at what you spend on groceries, if you do that, in fact, that is probably challenge number one is, are you even aware of what you spend on groceries? And in most cases, when I ask people this question, sometimes they say, oh yeah, I know. And then I have them actually track what they spend. And there are always some light bulb moments there. A lot of times we don't think about the real small little trips that we make to the store and buy food, underestimate what we spend every time we go, and we just lose track of it. And so if you're not actually tracking it dollar by dollar, you likely don't know. So that would be a really good place to start because you have to have a realistic picture of what's happening before you know what you'd like to fix and how you'd like to fix it. That would be a really good place to start is really to have an accurate picture first. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't need fancy spreadsheets or trackers or whatever it might be. You truly can just choose to use a piece of paper if you wish. If my family of 10 spent what the FDA says that we should be spending or different websites or or things that talk about this thing, these things if we spent what they said my family should spend based on our size, we would not be able to live doing anything else. There is no way that my family could spend what is quote unquote average for a family of our size, not even close. And that has never been the case. And not only that, I don't want to spend that much money on food. I would much rather spend money on vacations and fun things and, and all of that. And I always have. And so that's why throughout my married life, as long as I've been responsible for buying my own food, my challenge has been, how can I eat well, but eat smart? And how can I continue to tweak and change things? Really, in reality, where can I spend some time so that I can yield the greatest benefit? And really spending time, especially with as many people eating food as we have, Spending time focused in this area in making things from scratch rather than buying them, in making breakfast rather than eating it from a box, in making sure that we're not spending every single day on groceries so that the budget, the, the grocery spending gets way out of control without us noticing. These have always been things that I have known have been worth my time. And we really have a lifestyle that shows that because our food budget has always been in check, we have been able to do and experience a lot of other things in our life simply because we're not putting money into food. Really, it doesn't need to be there. Did you know that 
they say, um, and I and I just looked this up in 2024. It is said that people in America throw away 40 percent of the food that they of the food that they buy. 40% of the money that you spend on food, just open up your trash can and throw it directly in there. Save yourself the hassle. 40%. While that's scary, it also is really eye-opening and really encouraging to know that, wow, there's a lot of room for improvement there just in that one skill. So you may have heard me talk before about that being a really great place to start. Commit to throwing no food away. There's no way around that. That is a huge skill. So we're not going to necessarily list that as one of the strategies today because I want to give you something different. But just because I'm giving you different strategies today does not mean that that is not the number one thing, the most powerful thing that I think you can do when it comes to spending less on groceries. If you can make sure that you are throwing no food away, most likely you might not be throwing away 40% of the food you buy. But most likely you are throwing away way more of the food that you buy than you realize or that you would like to when you do realize. So that's still my number one piece of advice, but we're going to jump into some different strategies here. So strategy number one when it comes to uh, spending less on groceries is to know your leftovers. Leftovers are something that are probably in every single refrigerator across America right now to varying amounts. Because a lot of times, if I look at what causes leftovers in my family, of course, we're cooking for many, right? And so we always need to have enough. The last thing I want is not enough. So part of the reason why I have leftovers is because I'm overcooking. Because again, I want to make sure I have enough. And it is really nice to have leftovers. Honestly, it's not, I don't, I don't worry about making too much. Because I know that we will use up the leftovers. And I know that when there are leftovers, that's less cooking for me. Leftovers are essentially a way for you to be your own sous chef. I mean, why not? So know your leftovers, though. You have to know what's in your refrigerator that is leftovers. Maybe you've got some leftovers in your freezer. Maybe you've got them on your kitchen counter or your pantry or wherever it is you keep food. But know what they are all the time. What do you have in your refrigerator, in your pantry, in wherever right now that needs to be eaten soon so that it doesn't have to be thrown in the trash with that 40% statistic like we just talked about? You have to know what they are, though, and this means you have to put forth time and effort into knowing. You've got to keep track. You have to be looking. What do I have that's left over? What do I have that needs to be used up? You have to. It starts with, ha- with knowing what you have. Strategy number two completely builds on that one, and it is to use your leftovers. It's not enough just to know, oh, yeah, I've got that in my refrigerator. We really should make sure we eat that. And then what happens? If that's, if that's the way the conversation goes, again, most likely just open up that trash can, throw it down the garbage disposal if you've got one of those. If it's, oh, yeah, that's right, we should use that up, and that's as far as it goes, chances are it's never going to get used up or eaten. So it takes, again, concentrated time and effort on your part to use your leftovers. But if you don't want to throw them away, you actually have to use them. So when you know what your leftovers are, when you take this accounting of what's in your refrigerator every couple of days is what I suggest. When you find the answer to what's in my refrigerator, you need to plan for what's in your refrigerator. When you discover this, that, or the other thing, when or how are you going to eat that? You've got to plan how you're going to eat that and plan it into when you're going to eat that if you want it to be eaten. One thing I know is if if you live with people and you think, for the most part, you think that you're going to say, hey, there are some leftovers in the fridge. Can you make sure you eat those up? You're going to get the head nod. You're going to get the uh uh-huh. You're going to get the sure. And it's never going to happen. If you are the one who wants to spend less on groceries, then you have to spearhead this thing. You have to know what your leftovers are, and you have to know how to use them and make sure that they get used in that way. And again, that's probably going to require time and effort on your part. But man, it is so nice to not spend as much on on food as people tell me I should. So know your leftovers, use your leftovers. Third strategy. 
Commit to buying only what's on sale. Commit to buying only what's on sale. Now, of course, if you're new to kind of paying attention, you're new to this concept of wanting to commit to buying what's on sale, there are going to be plenty of things that you have to start that you still have to buy that aren't on sale. But the thing is, is that everything that you buy at one time or another is on sale or is going to be on sale. And so if you make the commitment, know that it's a work in progress. You're kind of committing to the marathon, not the sprint. So this week, though, when you're thinking about what am I going to make for dinner? Open up the flyer. Look it up online. What's on sale? Plan and make your meals around what's on sale. Start there. And then when you're thinking, I need more of this, that, or the other thing, and it's not on sale, ask yourself, do I really have to have it now? Or can we do without that? And I can wait and I can watch for that to be on sale and I can buy it then. Now, the one difference here is if you shop at a store where things are always lower priced, for instance, I shop at a store named Aldi. If you're not familiar with Aldi, I'm so sorry because it is a store. If you don't have the ability to be familiar with Aldi, I am so sorry about that because It is a store where we spend so much less simply because everything there is priced so much much less. less. I'm not going to get into their business model or the reasons why. Just know that many, many, many things at Aldi are cheaper than you will find them in a store even when on sale, even if combined with some sort of coupon. Now that said, not everything at a store like that is always going to be cheapest. So just know that. Know that you're going to have to be aware. Commit to buying only what's on sale, whatever that might look like. It's, it's a matter of, I'm not going to buy that if it's not on sale, and I'm going to wait until it is before I buy it. It's a commitment. It's going to be a new way of looking at things if you've never done anything even close. But commit to buying what's on sale. That's strategy number three. Strategy number four, know your daily budget for meals. Know your daily budget for meals. What does that mean? Well, essentially, you first have to start with what is your grocery budget, right? We have to start from bigger and work to smaller. And you can see that a daily budget is pretty granular. So you you can't start with granular. You've got to start with the bigger picture. So what is your monthly grocery budget? What is your monthly food budget? Know what that is. When you know what that is, you can take that and divide it by 30 to get your average daily balance for meals. When you know that, then you know what you, when you know that amount, you can match the foods that you eat in a day to hit that amount. If you, and the thing is, is if you're going to be eating more expensive one day, well, that's fine. Then you have a day or two where you fall under that daily grocery limit. Knowing what your daily budget is for food helps you make sure that you actually hit the budget. Because here's where a lot of people miss it. They create a monthly spending allowance or a monthly budget for groceries, and then they just shop. And then at the end of the month, if they're lucky, they look at it and they see how they did. And they say, whoa, wow, what went wrong? I had this grocery budget. I knew how much I had to spend, but I still spent way over that. How did that happen? Well, the way that that happens is because you're not in it on the daily, making sure that you stick to the budget. When you go to the grocery store every week, if that's what you do, and that is a great goal to have, the more, here's what I know, the more often you're in the grocery store, the more opportunity you have to overspend, right? The more often you're in the grocery store, the more opportunity you have to overspend. So let's just say, let's just say that going to the store weekly is the goal. And that's what you that's what you do. If you are not going there with your weekly budget in mind, knowing what that is and making sure that the groceries you buy fall within that, you're you're not going to hit your grocery budget. That's what you've got to do. It's not enough to decide what it is. It's not enough to forecast, "Hey, this is what I should spend." You have to make sure you actually spend it. And when you've got this daily food amount that you, when you know what that is, it helps you know how to plan meals for each and every day. It helps you know what to make. You've got to know what to make when you plan your meal plan 
And then you've got to follow that when you go to the grocery store. Even if your meal plan is once a day, even if you're not creating a weekly meal plan, as I suggest, and it is super beneficial and it's not as hard as it sounds. But when you have that weekly or even that daily plan, you know, you you can make sure that that falls within what you can afford in the overall picture of a month. If you want to eat five, eight, 10 expensive meals that are over that, you can do that as long as, and, and hit your grocery budget, as long as you're also having plenty of meals that fall under the budget so that overall you hit that monthly amount. But that monthly amount can only be achieved on a more granular level, paying attention to your weekly shopping list and your weekly spend. And even wiser, breaking it down to that daily level. What can you spend in a day on food, on the meals you make, in order to make sure that you are not overspending and overshooting your monthly grocery budget? Work from your general monthly budget all the way down to your weekly budget, all the way down to your daily budget. That's strategy number four. Strategy number five is to create what I call a price log. What is a price log? Well, a lot of times I have people who ask me this question. They'll say, hey, I found uh, pork chops for $1.99 a pound. Is that a good price? And I can tell them what a good price could be in my area where I live, but that's not the same for prices everywhere. Prices vary based on where you live, based on different store structures, based on how their sale items work. And so a price log will help you answer that question for yourself because that's, that's the only way that's going to be accurate. The only way that is this a good price, the only way that you know how to answer that question is if you have something to reference. Is that a good price? And so a price log, again, doesn't have to be overcomplicated. You don't need something fancy. It can just be a piece of paper where every time, here's how you create one. Every time you shop, you come home with a receipt. And yes, you could opt in for online sorts of receipts. Just make sure that you're utilizing those online receipts in this way then. So you get your receipt for everything that you bought. You write it down. You start just by tracking it all. Then when you buy that same thing, that same thing that you bought three weeks ago, you buy again now. Well, now you have two opportunities to compare. How much did you spend on pork chops? And when things are on sale, you start keeping track of the sale prices. Maybe you recognize that typically pork chops are $3.29 a pound, but now they're on sale for $1.99 a pound. Sometimes they're on sale for $2.49 a pound. When are you going to buy them? Are you going to go to the store and buy them when they're $3.29? Are you going to look at the sale when it's $2.49 a pound and say, wow, I should stock up? Well, a price log will tell you, no, the lowest I have found them is $1.99. And so I'm going to wait to buy them until they're at that $1.99 price point. And when they are, I am going to figure out how to stock up because I don't want, I, I want to be able to eat pork chops at other times, but I, I am committed to buying them when they're on sale. Therefore, I want to have enough in my freezer or my, theoretically your freezer. I want to have enough, I want to have enough in my freezer so that when I want to have pork chops, I can, but I've never overpaid for them. And if I go to my freezer and I think, oh, I'd like to have pork chops this week, and I go to my freezer and they're not there. Well, again, that commitment to buying what's on sale says, well, I don't have any right now, so I'm going to choose something different, and I'll wait until they are on sale. But that price log will help you know, essentially, your good, better, and best prices for something. This is how I like to create mine, good, better, and best. And again, don't buy it when it doesn't fall into one of those three categories. And the amount that you buy it's a decision. Do you want to buy it when it's good? How important is it to you to have the pork chops? What does your monthly budget look like? How are you doing on that daily budget? Do you have some wiggle room to say, you know what, I'm going to pay a little bit more for pork chops this week and I have the room to do so. But it all starts with this knowledge. So these five strategies that I've shared with you today really can be things that you start to do. If, if these are new habits to you, that they're just that they're habits. You're going to have to get into the habit of paying attention to your leftovers. You're going to have to get into the habit of using your leftovers. 
You're going to have to get into the habit of not buying what you want or what sounds good, but buying what's on sale. You're going to have to get into the habit of paying attention every day or two to how much am I actually spending on the meals I eat and the meals that I make. And how do I need to adjust in the coming days to accommodate for how I have been doing? How do I want to manage my month overall on that daily basis? How do I want to manage that overall? And making sure that in that overall month average, your days are what you need them to be in order to stay within that monthly spending that you decided upon. And Of course, creating a price log, well, that's a habit you're going to build and practice and continue to do as well. Yes, it's about these actions to take, but as a life coach, you've heard me say before, it's not, our focus shouldn't be on the things we're going to do and not do. Our focus should be on the habit of deciding, showing up and following through with what I said I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to know my leftovers. And so as much as I'm working on knowing my leftovers, I am starting the habit and continuing to practice the habit of paying attention to my leftovers. It's a habit. And the cool thing about habits is you are the one who is who is completely in control of that. Are you in control of what the grocery prices are? Man, wouldn't it be nice if we were? <laughs> but we're not. But we can control what we do. And one of the easiest ways we can do that is by creating and practicing habits. So these strategies today are not only going to help you, they're going to be excellent habits that you can build. If you want to spend less on groceries, you absolutely can decide to do that. These five strategies are a great place to start. Until next time, we'll we'll talk again next time and make sure to make it an intentional day. Well, the next episode of the Intentional Mom podcast will fall on a Monday. And you know what that means. It's going to be time for a shiny new mantra, a place to park your mindset, a way to take back the control of the thoughts that you have in your mind. That's what a mantra is here to do for you. So make sure you tune in for the next episode of the Intentional Mom podcast to get yourself a shiny new mindset mantra to start your week on. We'll talk then.